Welcome to our Portions Podcast, where we discuss the portions of Scripture that are being read in the synagogues around the world each and every week. The goal and desire of these podcasts are that you would not only learn and be encouraged by the Scripture, but also that your heart would be enlarged where Israel and the Jewish people are concerned. So I ask you to open your Bible and open your heart, and I pray that over the course of the next 20 minutes, that the God of Israel would meet us as we study His Word together. I'm so blessed to be here today. Thank you guys for showing up. (laughs) Sunday, you kind of have to be here, right? Hello, Salisbury. Can we just greet our Salisbury family? We love you, Salisbury. Uh, I I have to start off by saying that uh, I'm slightly uncomfortable or have been slightly uncomfortable this week in preparing for this word. Typically, when I get to speak, it's it's, it's kind of accompanied with with a level of confidence because I feel like maybe the thing I'm speaking about I have a, a good grasp on. And I don't know that this is the best way to start a message, but I'm just gonna tell you I don't have a great grasp on what I'm speaking about today because I have not lived what I'm about to preach. Uh, So when Pastor Jay asked me if I would speak on freedom, the first thing that came to my mind was fasting the pathway to freedom. And I thought, I can't preach on fasting because I stink at it. (laughs) Like, I'm bad. I don't like it. I don't practice it. And I felt like it would be really hypocritical to speak on it. Plus, if I spoke on it, then maybe God would require me to live it, (laughs) which is another good reason to not speak on things that you're not willing to do. I was in Orlando earlier this week, and actually last week in the service, I, was, I, I showed Beth. I said, honey, I think I know what I'm going to speak on next week. Because as I was sitting here, I was just being inspired with a couple of things. And I get to Orlando, and I was there for a board meeting for another organization. And I was working out with a friend of mine in his little garage gym. And he said, are you going to be around? Uh, where are you going to be this Sunday? I said, I'm speaking at my home church, The Refuge. And he said, what are you speaking on? And I, I, I told him, uh, freedom. And out of his mouth, the phrase just comes, fasting, the pathway to freedom. And I just kind of looked at him. I said, dude, I cannot believe you just said that. It was a confirmation to me that not only am I supposed to speak on it, but I'm supposed to live it. And... Uh, I give anybody permission to leave right now (laughs) because once you hear this, you and I are accountable to God, not in legalistic measures, but in a love relationship with him. The Bible says, be not hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves, but be doers of the word. So I'm, I'm confessing from the start that I'm preaching to myself. And um, if I amen myself, (laughs) well, Scott, that was good. No, no, no. Uh, I I just want your hearts to be open. And um, I want to ask you, if this is the word of the Lord, maybe we should all be saying, Lord, is there anything in this that you are requiring of me? Actually, you should be saying that every Sunday as you sit here. And every day that you open the word, Lord, is there something you're requiring of me? Because when we live that way, then we become uh, amazingly, amazingly equipped by God to face every single life situation that comes our way. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? We're going to be reading out of Isaiah 58 today. I'm going to start with just one verse in Isaiah 58.
God's chosen fast. Isaiah 58, 6. Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness. To undo the bands of the yoke. And to let the oppressed go free. And break every yoke. Friends, we serve a yoke-breaking God. And that word (laughs) yoke does not mean egg. As one of my children just recently came to figure out, and it wasn't my youngest, I'll just say that. I've got four adult children and it was one of them. Oh, yoke doesn't mean egg. Yoke is this this harness or this, this if, if I grew up in northern Minnesota in my teenage years, and we had yokes, and it would be like this two-by-four board or metal piece with these two, like, places for you to put the animals' heads in, and you're yoked together. Cow, cow, plow in the fields. Jesus calls us to take his yoke on us, right? Being yoked to the Lord. There's a, a scripture in Lamentations that says it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Yokes can be great things, but they can be absolutely detestable things. Especially if we're yoked to bondage. You want to get rid of, you want to get rid of this thing that you're yoked to, It's not God's heart for you to be yoked to pornography. It's not God's heart for you to be yoked to addiction or yoked to anxiety. That's not his heart. We've already talked about that. It was, it was, we we worshiped to the name of Jesus. That's awesome. And I'm so grateful that that one name proclaimed means the end of everything. But there may be something required of us. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. And what is it? It's God's fast. Lord, we we stand here. We say, speak to us. I say, Lord, speak to me. (laughs) May I not live the same from this day forward. May your word go forth today and may lives be changed for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna say this from the start, you may be seated. I wanna say this from the start. God is not looking for people to fast religiously. He's not, and there's, because there's a wrong kind of fasting. Just because you're denying your body of food doesn't mean that God is pleased with it. Matthew chapter 6, it says, when you pray, don't pray like the Pharisees do. There's a wrong way of praying that does not touch God's heart at all. He says, but when you pray, go into your closet and the Lord who, who sees in secret will reward openly. You can spend your whole life praying and praying the wrong way. The Bible says when you give, don't give like these people who want want everybody to see what they're doing. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. When you do that way, the Lord who sees in secret will reward openly. And when you fast, it's interesting it doesn't say if you give, it says when you give. It doesn't say if you pray, it says when you pray. Because disciples and followers of the Lord are called to live lives that are pleasing to him, including giving, fasting, praying, and a whole host of other things. But I would venture to say, if you're anything like me, fasting has not been part of your ongoing relationship and life in the kingdom. Will you go to hell for not fasting? No. I don't think it's a hell a heaven breaker. 
but you have no idea and I have no idea what we are missing out on by not paying attention to what Jesus calls us to do. Because God's fasts break the yoke. I love counselors. I love counselors. There are, Jesus is, he's the Lord, the wonderful counselor. Counseling is great, but can I tell you something? You can spend decades in counseling and find that after a godly kind of fast, the yoke that was never broken from a counselor who desired to see that yoke broken is absolutely and completely gone. One moment in God's presence changes everything. Don't stop going to counselors, friends. You do what the Lord tells you to do. But maybe we're supposed to start fasting. Because when God chooses a fast, it's to break the yoke. I got about a quarter of the way through my notes in the first service. So I'm going to start where I left off. Is that okay? And I'm not even going to tell you what I spoke about in the first service. Open up to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. I'm sorry, Esther chapter 3, verse 8. It's amazing, friends, that I as a 56-year-old man feel like I have been so blessed by the Lord. But this week, as I was praying and as I was preparing, I feel like I have missed out on something that is so radically important in my life. Not because I didn't hear it preached about or demonstrated, but because I wasn't willing to pay the price and live this way. I, uh, Beth and I just celebrated our 33rd anniversary two days ago. 33 years. <clears throat> when I met her, I knew she was supposed to be my wife. So we started, we started dating, told her how I felt about her, and then she broke up with me. <laughs> oh, Yahweh, yes way, yes way. And then, then we got engaged, and she broke up with me again. <laughs> But after the first, it was after the first time we, we broke up. She didn't really break up with me. She, she wasn't mean at all. She just wasn't realizing how amazing of a guy I was. <laughs> I'm like, honey. Obviously, she was needing the Lord to, to like solidify in her heart that I was the one that she was going to live with forever. So after the first breakup, which happened to be on Super Bowl Sunday. I'll never forget it. We were watching the Super Bowl at a friend's house. I had given her my high school class ring and we're walking back to my dormitory and she takes that ring off and she says, I don't think I can wear this anymore. (laughs) And I said, well, listen, you know, whatever. She she goes her way and I pick up the phone. I call my parents. (laughs) I said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe this. Because I was pretty convinced that the Lord showed me that Beth was supposed to be my wife. So I did something that I had never done before, and I went on a fast for seven days. I'm not saying this to brag, because I'm pretty much a wuss when it comes to fasting, but I wanted her really bad. (laughs) Seven days. On the seventh day, I am like famished, and I'm in my room, and I'm kneeling at my bed. I have my Bible. I've never done this before or since. And I said, Lord, I need to hear from you because I want to eat tonight. (laughs) And I closed my eyes, and I opened the Word, and I put it on my dorm room bed, and I put my finger on the Scripture. And it was Psalm 4610 that says this, be still and know that I am God. But in my version, the New American Standard, there was a little asterisk next to be still, and it said, let go relax, and know that I am God. In other words, let go of driving the car of this relationship. Let me be in the driver's seat and watch what I will do. As a result of that 
fast, I can say, thankfully, that we have had 33 amazing years of marriage with 33, oh, 50 more in front of us. But do you know what the key was for me? Fasting. And I forgot it. Was it hard? Yes. You know why people don't fast? Because you get hungry. <laughs> And some of you may have already, before I just said that, texted somebody saying, where are you going for lunch today? Because it's noon, and I didn't eat my breakfast, and I'm kind of feeling a little hungry right now. It's amazing how much our appetite drives us. And whether the appetite is food, or whether the appetite is yoked to things that are detrimental to our walk with the Lord, we feel like we can't live unless we have it. And fasting is simply this denying your flesh for the purpose of getting close with your God. I know people fast other things. We were talking about this a little bit between services, fasting social media. No problem with that. But you're still eating. <laughs> I, I think it's good to fast things. You want to fast TV? You want to fast playing golf, I don't care what you're fast. But a biblical fast is talking about denying yourself of food. Everybody say food. And it hurts. You're hungry. That's not a sign that God wants you to break your fast. It's probably a sign that you're doing something right. Jesus started off his ministry. It says, the Spirit led him into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days, and he was hungry. Oh, if I'm fasting, I shouldn't be getting hungry. God's, people talk about God's grace on them to fast. I don't, I don't get that. It's like you fast and you're not hungry? Well, that's okay if that works for some people. Not me. All the more, we should be fasting. Because when we allow ourselves to be in a position of hunger, we humble ourselves by refusing what is going to satisfy us for the sake, what is going to temporarily satisfy us for the sake of what is going to eternally gratify us. This is God's chosen fast. To loose the bonds, to break the yoke. So there's a crazy situation here in the book of Esther. Chapter 3, listen to this. There's a guy named Haman. Haman's an evil man. This is what he said to the king, Ahasuerus. This is what he said. There's a certain people, speaking of the Jewish people, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among all the peoples in the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people. They do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Check out this verse. This is crazy. Verse 9. If it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasury. Verse 13. Letters were sent by couriers to all of the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate both young and old, all the Jews, women, and children in one day. That is diabolical. We're not talking about anti-Semitism today, but Here's the deal. When God chooses something, Satan chooses it too. <laughs> Ever since God chose one nation to be the nation through whom Messiah would come, they've been in the crosshairs of the devil's plans and schemes. The devil wants to annihilate Israel because Israel carries the key to world redemption through Jesus the Messiah who was birthed through a Jewish womb. No wonder the devil wants all the Jews killed. And he's using Haman to plan this out. And the king agrees. So he writes these letters to all of his provinces. Everywhere the Jews are, they're to be annihilated. So how do you fight that? Well, let's, let's take up arms. Let's, let's revolt. Let's... Let's fight these guys. Let's get, we got to get into weight training. We got to work. We got we to build an army. We got to fight against these demonic people who want to see us destroyed. Well, maybe, but not here. Look what Esther did. 
Verse 15. By the way, Mordecai told Esther, he said, listen, you got to go into the king. You got to tell the king what's going on. But there was a problem. If you walked into the king's chamber, even if you were the queen and his wife, if you were not invited, the king had two henchmen on either side that would literally lop off your neck unless he raised his golden scepter and invited you in. That's a pretty risky chance to take when you're not invited. So Mordecai says you got to go in. Look, what, look at how Esther responds. Verse 15. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Fast for me. What, what kind of game plan is that? Fast for me? Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night, I and my maidens will also fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And then maybe, one, two, three, five of the most famous words in all of the Bible, and if I perish, I perish. She was risking her neck. But the way in which she thought the best way to prepare for it would be fasting. Why? Because when we fast according to kingdom principles, God breaks the yoke. God loosens the bands. God sets captives free. We talked in the first service about Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. Or three or four armies coming against him. He had nowhere to go. The Bible says he was afraid. And he called a fast. A fast. Why should, why should an army grow hungry in the day of battle? Because if you rely on your own weapons and your own ingenuity and your own strength, you are bound to fail. Friends, God never loses a battle. Do you know that? Over 230 times in the Bible, the Lord is called the Lord of hosts. I think it's the name that he is most referred to. In Hebrew, it's Adonai Tsevaot, the God of armies. So when the Bible says the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, friends, we don't need machine guns. We don't need nifty war plans. We need kingdom plans. And one of those plans, friends, is fasting. Because in Corinthians, it says this, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. I'll start it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh. Verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. There is a weapon that God has placed in our arsenal that many, if not most of us, are not using regularly. I shouldn't say many or most. I don't know whether you are. I'm not. And if we want freedom in our lives, I'm here to tell you that the Lord is desiring for us, men and women, in this place today to adopt a lifestyle of fasting. It's interesting that Jesus in Matthew 6 says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. If prayer is important and if giving is important, then fasting is important. I love that the refuge starts its year off with the Selah fast. For the last 17 years, at the start of every year, we've been encouraged to fast, which indicates to me that the leadership of this house is more, uh, more desirous of getting God's plan than their plan. And they're more desirous for us as a church body to get in tune with what God's calling us to do. Because it's not about the success of the refuge church. It's about the kingdom of God coming to Charlotte through those who he calls his church. I can't remember. I, I, I just have to be honest with you. I cannot remember the last time I fasted. And I thought to myself, I should probably fast before I speak. <laughs> I, I actually haven't eaten yet this morning. But when I walked into the, 
walked into the room in the back here and there were some scrambled eggs, bacon. There was just some stuff that's provided for the workers here. I thought, oh, I've got to grab something. And I thought, no, I don't. I wanted to give in at that moment. Is it, it's not wrong to eat. Believe me, it's not wrong to eat. I love food. But friends, there are seasons when God is looking for his men and his women not to adopt an earthly plan, but to grab hold of the kingdom plan. And that includes fast, fasting. Freedom in God, you know you are free not to fast. You know that. But can I tell you something? You'll never know what you're missing out on. I was sitting in back with one of pastor's sons, and I said, we were just talking. I said, I'm 56 years old, and I'm so bummed that I have not lived a lifestyle of fasting until today. Because I'm telling you what, I'm changing things. Because I got asked to speak on freedom. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> Don't raise your hands. How many of you are living a fasting kind of lifestyle? I'm not talking, I'm not, forget 21 days, 40 days. How many of you regularly fast? How many of you regularly pray? How many of you regularly give? Friends, it's interesting because in that Matthew 6 passage, in every pl place, giving, praying, and fasting, it says the Lord who sees in secret will reward and open. There are rewards we're missing out on when we don't live this way. And there's freedoms that we're missing out on as well. Esther, if I perish, I perish. She goes into the king. The king welcomes her. She then, you got to read the book of Esther. It's amazing. Esther chapter 7, verse 10. Here's how the story ends, but I want you to read it so that you can grab hold of it. Esther 7, verse 10. In the end, the man who erected the gallows for Mordecai to die on, the man who devised this evil plan that was destined to work because the king bought into it, Esther 7.10, so they hanged Haman on the gallows which he had prepared for Mordecai. That's what fasting does. Fasting saves the, the Israel army in 2 Chronicles 20 when Jehoshaphat calls a fast and the four or five invading armies end up killing each other. Who, who would have thunk it? Bad English. Who would have ever thought of that? And it was initiated by a fast. Fasting gets God's attention, friends. Oh my gosh, I don't even know where to go. <laughs> okay. I'm going to close. I'm going to close with the scripture we started with. Isaiah 58. God doesn't want me to tell you how to fast because I don't even know. I mean, sure, we can look it up. You can Google it. You can hear people speak. What, what I'm trying to impart into me even as I'm speaking is am I willing to embrace this as a lifestyle so that I can be free and those around me free? By the way, when, God's, when God brings freedom to you, you know what happens? He brings freedom to others too. It's interesting, Acts chapter 16, I was reading it earlier this week. <sighs> I just want to get close to you for a second. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas in prison at midnight, the darkest hour, and what do they decide to do? They decide to praise at midnight and their bonds come off. But it wasn't just them, it was everybody who heard them singing too. Everyone. That's what God wants to do. What if your breakthrough, what if your freedom can affect your family? What if it can affect others who are walking through situations that you're walking through who may see something in your life and say, Lord, I want it, I need it. Friends, we have no idea what fasting will do. Isaiah 58. Is this not the fast? You know what, stand with me, will you? Do you mind, please? <clears throat> Worship team, you guys can come on up. Is this not the fast which I chose, choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness? To undo the bands of the yoke and to the, uh, let the oppressed go free? Verse 8. This is what happens when we fast. 
then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your recovery will speedily spring forth. Your recovery. Oh, I'm in recovery. Whoa, gosh. Your recovery will speedily spring forth. Your righteousness. Oh, Scott, you'd have no idea what I'm bound to. Can I tell you something? Whatever it is that you're bound to will turn in your life to righteousness. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Well, how about that? He's right behind me and he's in front of me and nothing, nothing can destroy God's plans. And then check this verse out, verse nine. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here am I. I, I got to quickly teach you a Hebrew word in closing. <laughs> Repeat this after me. Hineni. If you've known me long enough, you asked me to speak one time anywhere, this is my life message. I don't know if I've ever spoken it at the refuge in however many years I've been here. Hineni. Say it again. Hineni means here am I. It's two Hebrew words. The first is hine, which is behold. The second is ani, which is me. So what it means is behold me. In other words, when we say hineni, we're saying, don't look anywhere else. Look right here. I'm your guy. And whatever you say to me, I will do it. So God cries out, Abraham, Abraham, in Genesis chapter 22. Abraham says, hineni, here I am, Lord. Whatever you say, I will do. And then God says, take now your son, your only son, and put him on the altar. What? Thankfully, God who provides, by the way, the first place in scripture where it says the Lord provides is right there in Genesis 22. God provided the ram in the thicket. Or in Exodus chapter two or three, when God needs someone to be a deliverer and Moses is walking by the burning bush and God calls out from the bush, Moses, Moses, Moses says, Hineni, here am I. Whatever you say, I'm going to do it. Go, go take my people and deliver them out. But, but God, I'm 80 years old. I'm all forgotten. I'm weak. I can't even speak. No, no, no. Now's your time. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is actually interrupting a conversation that he's hearing in heaven when the Lord says, who will go for us? God needed somebody. You know what Isaiah said? Hineni, here am I. Send me. You would think that when you, when you, when you uh, volunteer to do something for God that he'll send you to a place you like, like Hawaii. <laughs> the, the thing about Hineni is we're volunteering for something that we don't know what we're volunteering for. I mean, if I said, hey, listen, we're going to take a refuge mission trip to Oahu where we're surfing and minister, ministering to people on the beaches and your trip is all paid for, you know what you would say? Hineni. God's not like that. But right here, in the context of fasting, you know what the Lord says to us? Hineni, here am I. <laughs> Ask me whatever you want and I will do it for you. The, the one place in scripture where he says Hineni that I know of to us is right here. In the context of fasting. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and, he'll, he, and, and he will say, here am I. Verse 11, the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. You'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. From those among you, you will rebuild ancient cities. You who have been walking with yokes around your neck, never thinking that you would be free are the very ones that God is going to use to build his kingdom in this city. Do you believe it? I do. It's the word of God. So here's what I wanna do as we close. The worship team is going to sing just a bridge from a song called Available. And I am asking you, <laughs> if you felt like the Lord speaking to you today, 
I don't know if I've ever done this, but I'm responding to my own altar call. (laughs) I need Jesus in the area of fasting. I want to be a man known who's willing to give up his carnal earthly appetite for the kingdom reality of seeing chains broken and bonds loosened and captives set free. So Lord, here we are. Hineni, here we are, available to you. We ask right now, great God, that you will meet us as we sing this as a prayer and as a proclamation, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. I just feel led that if you want to say Hineni to God in the area of fasting in your life, I just want to encourage you to join me up here. Let's sing this together, and then we're going to close together. Father, here we are. Use us for your glory. You can have it all here. will break forth like the dawn. Your recovery will speedily spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. You will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. The Lord will continually guide you. Satisfy your desire in scorched places. Give strength to your bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers in the streets in which you dwell. Father, look down. For each one up here at the altar, for those in their seats, you know our hearts, Lord. I thank you that you're not desiring us to do anything in a religious way to gain your love for us. You've done that already. You love us with an everlasting love. Thank you that we can't earn your love. It's given freely. But Lord, as we step into lives, 
Hineni lives in the area of fasting. I pray, great God, for testimonies to shoot through this church family of chains being broken. Lord, things we've prayed for and longed for all of a sudden coming forth, whether it happens in a day or a year. Father, whenever it is, we give ourselves trusting that faithful are you who called. You will bring it to pass. Be glorified in the refuge family. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast today. For more information about Together for Israel, and the work that we're doing in the land of Israel, please visit our website at www.togetherforisrael.org. We look forward to you joining with us next week on another Portions Podcast.